Good morning. Good morning. This is Res and Kitty with Father's Heart Ministry, and this is the Morning Light Daily Broadcast. On this particular day, we of course, we're going through the Bible chapter by chapter. We started last year on January 5th, and we've now made our way to Deuteronomy chapter 31. Deuteronomy chapter 31, where Moses continues to finalize the affairs of Israel before his death. Now, it's going to mention about Moses' health and his lifespan. Uh, What was the key to Moses' long life? Remember that Paul said these things were recorded as examples to us on whom the ends of the age have come. So that means that there were many uh, patriarchs and many biblical figures. We don't know how long they lived. Some of them, we don't even know how they died. Why are we specifically told these things about Moses? And the Bible says it's plainly an example to us. Does that mean we could put our faith on having a vitality and a strength and a lifespan that Moses had? And when you see how long Moses lived, and you make a comparative extrapolation of what that means for us today, if it, its mention contains a promise for us, you're going to be astounded at what faith says is possible. Now, this is kind of like the book of Revelation. One man said, I've seen churches wait out in the book of Revelation and never come back. <laughs> That's pretty deep. And, uh, but we're just going to look at something. If we can't challenge our faith, you know, the Bible plainly says, Exodus fifteen twenty six, I will put none of those diseases upon you that I put upon the Egyptians. And Egypt, Egypt is a part of, uh, is an analogous to the world in the metaphor that the Bible validates in looking at the Old Testament. Uh, therefore, we should expect that the probability curve of good health for a born-again believer filled with the Holy Ghost Hold on, shot, ought though. to be different <laughs> than that. Of you know the list of your prescriptions should be shorter than that of a person who defies God, who doesn't believe in God. Mm. Your life's man, you should live longer. You know the world says uh, only the good die young. I beg your pardon. That's right. <laughs> uh, my God, my daddy is good, and he he's lived so long that he's never going to die, and he's never going to have a death certificate. And he's called the Ancient of Days. <laughs> <He's> called- <laughs> So does the presence of God uh, still attend us as it did Moses? I think, in fact, we'll see that we have a better, a more potent uh, variation of God's presence, manifestation of God's presence. And uh, does the presence of God extend life? How long can you, as a believer, expect to live? Can you change your life expectancy. Some of you, you know, depending on how you get out of the mo- bed in the morning, might think you got one foot in the grave. Well, we'll see if we can adjust that. Amen. Um, why did God reject Moses for striking the rock? We're going to talk about that. What was the rock's significance? And we're not talking about the guy that's on television. Uh <laughs> Are the first five books, if you're a wrestling fan, you know the rock's significance. But we're not talking about that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> what was the rock's significance? Are the first five books of the Bible the only true canon or the only canon closed by God himself? <laughs> the canon, the, the authoritative books that make up the 66 books of the Bible we print on rice paper and put in bonded leather. I believe even the leather is genuine. One guy said. <laughs> are these, all of these questions are going to be addressed in today's study. So we will begin Deuteronomy chapter 31. Miss Kitty, mm-hmm. if you will read the first nine verses. Will do. Verse 1. And Moses went and spake these words unto all Israel. And he said unto them, I am 120 years old this day. I can no more go out and come in. Also the Lord hath said unto me, Thou shalt not go over this Jordan. The Lord thy God will go over before thee, and he will destroy these nations from before thee, and thou shalt possess them. And Joshua, he shall go over before thee, as the Lord hath said. And the Lord shall do unto them, as he did unto Shihon, and to Og, the kings of the Amorites, and unto the land of them whom he destroyed. 
And the Lord shall give them up before your face, that ye may do unto them according to all the commandments which I have commanded you. Be strong and of a good courage. Fear not, nor be afraid of them. For the Lord thy God, he it is that go with thee, and he will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. And Moses called up unto Joshua, and said unto him in the sight of all Israel, Be strong and of good courage, for thou must go his people with his people into the land which the Lord thy God hath sworn unto their fathers to give them, and thou shalt cause them to inherit it. And the Lord he is it is that goeth before thee, and he will be with thee, he will not fail thee, neither forsake thee, fear not, neither be dismayed. And Moses wrote his law this law, and delivered it unto the priests and the the priests, the sons of Levi, which bear the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord and unto all the elders of Israel. So we're talking about crossing over. Moses is getting them ready to cross over. And notice there were many, you know, there were seven nations they had to defeat. But the very the only ones that are mentioned by name here, Og, king of Bashan, king of the Amorites. If you study out Og's name and the meaning of the name of the Amorites, basically that represents... Um, Arrogant, fast talkers. You know, you have your own personal Canaan land. And there are seven nations you have to defeat. And we've taught on this twice so far. But notice that the one that's specifically mentioned here is the arrogant, fast talkers. Whenever you're coming into your Canaan land, there's always going to be a fast talker wanting to sell you on his deal right when you're about to step into the land of promise. When you start getting <laughs> scammed, and how many people have been scammed by religious leadership? You know, that happens whenever we make uh, playbook promises for rule book compliance. You know, the, the, the playbook, the rule book is the Bible. The rule book is the Bible, the Logos. The playbook is the rhema prophetic word over your life. And so sometimes we go into the scripture and we'll take, see, the rule book keeps you from getting ejected from the game. The playbook helps you win the Super Bowl. Oh, mm -hmm. it, this is Super Bowl Sunday coming up. Coming up. Uh, let me say that again. <laughs> Here's one of the scams of a fast talker making playbook promises for rule book compliance. If you just won't break the rules, you know rules are made by elders that want to get to bed early. If you just won't break the rules, you'll come into your destiny. No, if you won't break the rules, you won't get ejected out of the game. Now get over there because you, you're, you're keeping the rules. Get over there in that huddle where Jesus, your quarterback, is. The spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus. And you get in that huddle with the prophetic voice in your life and you're going to get the playbook uh, that the rule, keeping the rules makes you eligible to hear. All prophecy is conditional. Say, so, well, just get that prophecy if it comes to pass. Okay, if not, must not have been God. No, it might not come to pass because you got ejected from the game. But one of the problems we have and one of the confusions, because the prophetic is not yet fully accepted. Imagine that after 2,000 years. <laughs> when he said he gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. Notice he mentioned prophets before evangelists, pastors, and teachers. <laughs> And he said that he gave these ministries, and the ministry of the prophet, 2 Corinthians 20.20, 20, is believe the prophet, so shall you prosper. Pastors are there to help keep you from breaking the rules. Pastors are there to keep you from getting ejected from the game. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you need them. Sure. But guess what? You also need, they're like the coach, but the prophetic minister is the one who's over there, who is, he is not the quarterback, but he's articulating the play that the quarterback, Jesus Christ the righteous, is calling. Because the spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus, Revelations 19.10. So you have to get past, see this is, you know you've been uh, subjected to a religious fast talker. When you got saved and two weeks later you're the Sunday school superintendent. Mm -hmm. Two weeks later you're, you know, you're an usher or you're out there, you know, with a little red flashlight helping people park in the parking lot. Because you've been subjected to the strategy of a spiritual fast talker. That's the first one you have to defeat. Now, notice that God tells Moses. Sorry. It's strong. <laughs> God tells Moses, he says, you're not going over this Jordan. Boy, you stop to think about that. The Bible says God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Amen. And Jordan in the Old Covenant is a metaphor for humility. 
The going down place. You said. It means, you look it up, it means the low place or the going down place. And the word humble means to go low. The word humble, as a word picture, is go to the Jordan. But here Moses, he struck the rock. He acted in pride and anger. And God says, I'm not going to give you the opportunity to humble yourself. Just like Pharaoh's heart was hardened. God told Pharaoh through Moses, let my people go. God hardened Pharaoh's heart, would not allow him to humble himself until the judgments had been proven upon him in the nation of Egypt. And God brought him out with a, a, a mighty. mighty hand, an outstretched arm. Amen. And so just as Esau, the Bible tells us, sought a place of repentance but could not find it, though he sought it carefully with tears, God would not let him go to the low place. And so Moses was not allowed to go to the Jordan. He was not allowed to find a place of repentance from the pride with which he struck the rock. Oh, that puts the fear of God in my life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but yet in the midst of all of that, look at the man's testimony. What an amazing thing that he lived as long as he did, 120 years. Mm -hmm. That's a long time. And was vital enough to lead two million people in a refugee situation into a new land. And in all that time... Deuteronomy 34, which we hadn't got to yet, says that he was 120 years old when he died and his eye was not dim and his natural force was not abated. What do you mean natural force? My daddy is 81 years old. He can still beat me at arm wrestling. <laughs> my, dad, my dad was, among other things, in the ministry, but he was also a painter for a lot of years. And he didn't, pray with a, he didn't paint with a spray rig. He painted with a roller and a brush. And he's got four arms that look like Popeye, minus the tattoos of the anchor on them. <laughs> and even my boys, big old strapping boys, would line up when Grandpa would come to visit. And uh, they'd, they'd want to beat Grandpa at arm wrestling. He'd sit down with a bread sandwich, two pieces of bread. If you have been in the, grew up in the Depression, you know what that is. He'd sit down with the two pieces of bread, a bread sandwich in one hand, and a lopsided grin, and put his arm out there. He said, okay, boys. And they'd be sitting there grunting and sweating and doing all they can. He says, tell me when you're ready. Are you ready? Oh, you already went? Okay. And then, boom, he put him down. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> and his natural strength has not abated. Now, you think about that, the strength of Moses. What was the key to Moses' strength? Now, let's talk about lifespan. The global life expectancy, including both men and women, in 2012 was 70 years old. If you take everybody's lifespan, divided by the number of people in the earth, and the time when they, the average person dies, uh, you can expect, as a citizen of the world, to live to the age of 70. Now, it changes depending on what part of the world. If you're in Sierra Leone, the average person dies by the age of 46. Wow. Oh, my goodness. 46-year-old still a baby in my eyes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> in the Western world, life expectancy ranges between 79 in the U.S. and 82 in Canada. What is it with you Canadians? That's another reason for me not to like you. You live longer than we do. <laughs> He's teasing. He loves you. <laughs> oh, we love our Canadian friends. <laughs> the longest life expectancy in the world is 84 in Japan. Ouch. Hmm. Uh, in Moses' day, now let's think about Moses, he lived to be 120. What was the average life expectancy in Moses' day? The average life expectancy in Moses' day was 30 years. My goodness. That's what archaeologists tell us when they look at the bones of people that have died and the records, most people died, the average person died by the age of 30. In Moses' day? In Moses' day. Wow. So Moses lived. Four times longer than the average person. And, and we're talking about in the Greco-Roman world. We're not talking about in China. And all, no, just in the Greco-Roman world, uh, uh, which he, Moses was a part of the early days of that. He lived four times longer. Okay. So, the average person lives to be 80 years old in the Western world. Take that times four. My goodness. What is that, 240, just off the top of my head? <laughs> 
320. 16 and 16, 320? 320. 300, you realize that comparatively speaking, it's kind of like we talk about $1,000 30 years ago was a lot more money than it is today. Mm -hmm. Well, when we're talking about the currency of your lifespan, Moses living to be 120 in his day would be like living to be 320 in our day. Wow. Do you think it had anything to do with him getting in the glory? Do you think it did? I think it did. Am I getting ahead of you, honey? No, that's okay. I'm glad you did. <laughs> Moses' life was affected by something beyond the norm. Sweet. In Exodus 34, as a man thinking that it's hard so easy, if you think all you've got 70 years, guess what? That's all you got. I'll take the 120. Now let's have some more. How about that? Exodus, in Exodus 34, 29 through 35, we find that when Moses spent time in God's presence, his face would shine with an unusual luminescence. Mm -hmm. And if you look at this, you study the uh, uh, artwork of the ancient world, you will always find even in like uh, tiles, they'll find decorative floors and tiles from the first century, second century. They would always depict halos around the faces of the apostles and and various ones. I wonder why that was. Because the halos depicted around the saints and the divines in ancient art suggest something about the presence of God that had an impact upon the physical appearance and characteristics that no doubt included residual health effects. John the Revelator. It's a known fact. He was the only... I'm sorry, not John the Revelator, John, uh, well, it might have been him, John the Beloved. Some people question whether the John that wrote Revelation and the John that wrote the fourth gospel were one and the same person. We're not going to have that conversation. But nonetheless, John the Beloved, uh, they, he was the only disciple, apostle, who died a natural death. And he was ancient of days. He was so old, they were carrying him around and so vital that they would just, when he couldn't walk anymore, they'd pick him up and carry him to different places on foot so that he could continue his ministry. They tried to boil him in oil and he wouldn't die. <laughs> they couldn't, they couldn't over, something about his, his life span was unusual so much so that it becomes a, a matter of uh, church, church history. I personally... Um, Let's well, talk about uh, two other examples. In Acts 2-3, when the Holy Ghost was poured out, there was a luminescence like fire appearing on the 120. See, mm -hmm. the question is, does what happened to Moses still occur today? So oh, that was the Old Testament. Well, wait a minute. If you accept the fact that you and I are living in a New Testament dispensation, and you know that's a buzzword for many, and I use it just for convenience sake, I don't know that I consider myself a dispensationalist. Uh, you need to look no further than two particular passages in Acts. Acts 2.3, the luminescence like fire that appeared on the 120 when God's presence came in the upper room, just like it came on Moses when he was in the door of the tabernacle. And then at the martyrdom of Stephen, it was reported an, a, a similar effect, and it's interesting, under great pressure. The 120 were under great pressure. Mm -hmm. Moses, no doubt, with 2.2 million church members, okay, under great pressure, standing in the door of the tabernacle. It's interesting to me because usually when we're under pressure, we not only act like, but sometimes we look like something other than God's glory might dictate. Mm. When we're under pressure, usually that's when we, we, we defame ourselves. We... We bring ill repute on the, on the gospel. But notice that when you put these guys under pressure, it's like, it's like <laughs> my daddy used to employ when he was in the painting business. Um, they had, I was back in the tent evangelist days of the 50s, and the tent evangelists would come off. It was seasonal, and they would be a time you couldn't do tent meetings, and they'd all go to work for my dad painting. And there was this one tent evangelist. He came around the corner, and that tent evangelist was cussing up the storm like a sailor. And he turned around and told my dad, Oh, I'm so sorry I said that. And dad said, Well, if it wasn't in there, it wouldn't come out. Hello. I want you to see what came out of Moses under pressure was the, what the, the word glory means. It's the doxa. It's the effulgence of the divine, the light of God. 
what came out of Stephen when he was surrounded by those who got so mad at him they jumped over the, the banister uh, into the witness box when he was on trial for his life and gnashed on him with their teeth. My and his face, uh, Acts 6.15 said, he's, his face looked, as it were, the face of an angel, and that wasn't his friend saying that, that was his enemy saying that. Mm. They reported that. Mm, I personally worked under a minister who preached every day for almost 50 years, still preaching as far as I know. He's in his 80s now, and you meet this guy, he does not have one gray hair or one wrinkle on his face. Not one gray hair, not one wrinkle. The presence of God has an effect on our health. We gave the word out, Elijah Lewis published it, make his presence your priority. Amen. It has an effect on your health as we understand his presence to be something we can live under at all times and not just experience once in a while. That's the difference, folks. You hear us talk about the difference between habitation and visitation. Yeah. God wants you to walk in divine habitation. Yes, Lord. Nonetheless, Moses acknowledges that, and, and if they live that long under a fading glory, how much more so, the Bible says, under the unfading glory of the divine eternal life of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Now, they had Moses, who was sinful, had a problem with temper, uh, made a lot of mistakes. We have Jesus. Jesus is our Moses. How much more so can we walk in that glory? So Moses acknowledges that he disobeyed by striking the rock in Numbers 20.10. And he acknowledges that he would not, because of that, not be allowed to lead the people into the land of promise. Now, why was striking the rock so terrible? Because it violated a message in type and shadow that God was giving to the people. Again, these things happened to them as examples to us on whom the ends of the age have come. God was saying something through those events to you and I, and when Moses chose to disobey... He broke, and he was known to do that. Did he not break the tablets yes, written by God? I don't care how mad mm -hmm. you might get. If you saw a finger of God come out and write on a tablet of stone, I don't think, no matter how mad you were, you would not be breaking those tablets. But Moses was so mad after spending... Think about how carnal he must have been. After spending 40 days with God, and he was hungry, too. Don't forget, honey. Guys get cranky when they're hungry. <laughs> Sorry. He comes down, and he's so mad, he breaks the, the tablets. And it's interesting, because later on, when he goes back up, God says, now you make you some tablets. He's like, you broke it, you buy you it. You fix it. I wrote them one time. I'm not going to write them again. Well, he did. And, uh, <laughs> and then here he is. He's breaking another message from God by striking the rock. See, in, num in Numbers 20.10, it says he's not allowed to go into the land of promise. In Numbers, uh, the first time Moses was instructed to strike the rock was in Exodus 17.6. You go back and read Exodus 17.6, Moses strike the rock. In Numbers 20.10, where he messed up, his instructions were to speak to the rock. So first strike the rock, then speak to the rock, and then the third time, Numbers 21, 17, I love this one. It's one of my new favorite Old Testament verses. It said the people all came around, the entire nation of Israel came around a rock, and they began to sing. All the people, 2.2 million people singing, uh, spring up, O oh well, mm -hmm. and, and as they sang, the water began to flow out of the rock. Glory to God. But Moses messed it up because the second time he struck it again. Mm. What's wrong with that? In other words, he was saying that it would require man to do something uh -huh. by striking the rock okay. rather than speaking to the rock the second time. You see where God was going? See, what's the big deal about the rock? Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4, that we all drink the same spiritual drink for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. The rock was Jesus. Yes, the first time the water came out of the rock, the rock had to be smitten by man. And in fact, smitten by Moses as a representative of the law, taking on our sins. Then, through the preaching of the gospel, he intended, just speak to it now. 
He's already been smitten by the law and by the representative of the law when he was crucified. Cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree. Then after that, the representative of God was just supposed to speak or bring the word. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. See, the people are still striking the rock today because they're saying no man has to do something. Yes, Jesus did it all, but you have to do something. And they're trying to impose upon you performance-based religion Mm -hmm. instead of just believing the message of the Lord Jesus Christ. I've seen that in healing evangelists who would just walk up to somebody with a cancer and say, heal. They carried so much authority and glory of God. The person was healed. To speak in the word. Little grandma who, she was in a, a, a senior citizen's, uh, what do you call it, a nursing home, and her kids were taking her stuff. God healed her of cancer. They wrote it up in our paper, and she got to go home to her house and get her stuff back. <laughs> <laughs> so, you see, we do the same thing today. So the idea yeah. is, striking the rock the first time was man's intervention, Moses is a representative of the law, Jesus taking on the sins of the world. Mm -hmm. The second time was just supposed to be speaking. That's God's representative bringing the word. Faith coming by hearing, hearing by the word of God. But instead Moses struck the rock. That's the same. And turning around and pointing the finger, you rebels. That's somebody that steps on toes instead of washes feet. Mm -hmm. That's somebody that imposes a performance based saying, you fall short, you dirty sinner. And you got to do all these things I'm telling you to do or God won't love you. That's a performance based approach to God. And Moses was excluded and God, and think about it, from going to the place that represented humility. You ever seen any prideful preachers lately? Why don't they humble themselves? Maybe God won't let them humble themselves because they've been striking the rock and imposing a, a mentality of condemnation on God's people and refusing to humble themselves, demanding people to walk according to uh, the acceptance only found in religious performance mm-hmm. rather than just simply <clears throat> believing the word, speaking the word of faith. Think about it. Now I read verses 10 through 13. Love you, Debbie. Okay. And Moses commanded them, saying, At the end of every seven years, in the sol- solemnity, sol- solemnity, got solemnity, it. Solemnity. Solemnity. Of the year of release in the Feast of Tabernacles, when all Israel is come to appear before the Lord thy God in the place which he shall choose, thou shalt read this law before all Israel in their hearing. Gather the people together, men, women, and children, and thy stranger that is within thy gates, that they may hear, that they may learn, and fear the Lord your God, and observe to do all the words in this law, that, and that their children, which have not known anything, may hear and learn to fear the Lord your God, as long as you live in the land, whether you go over Jordan to possess it. So Moses commands that the law be read every seven years. Interestingly enough, not a random date. Every seven years at the culmination of the Feast of Tabernacles, there's three primary feasts. Passover, Pentecost, and Tabernacles. Passover speaks of the salvation experience. Pentecost speaks of the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Tabernacles speaks of the bo- of putting on immortality, the baptism of fire, the redemption of the purchased possession, the rapture of the saints, the adjudication of the saints, body felt salvation, whatever you want to call it, but it's the culmination of the threefold personal experience of accepting Jesus as Savior, impacting your spirit in the fulfillment of Passover and salvation, impacting your soul in the fulfillment of the baptism of the Holy Ghost, and impacting you physically at the final redemption of the tabernacle. And he says you're supposed to recite the law. You're supposed to recite the law. And it's, and it's interesting every seven years. Now, at the time of tabernacle, and it's interesting that there's no record that this was ever actually carried out by the people. There's no record that they actually ever did this, which is true of so much of the commands of the Lord through Moses. As much as, you know, the, they, they embraced the, the Torah and they embraced the writings of Moses, but there is so much of it that even under the most stringent Uh, regimes of leadership among the Hebrews for centuries, there's very little record that they ever, ever did most of this stuff. Hmm. Not a good track record. See, we have a record that it was received and supernaturally imparted, but very little verification in ancient history that it was ever followed through on. The people were as much... uh, as is true today, they were hearers of the word, but they were not doers. 
This answers the question as to why so much of the promise of God to the people was not fulfilled in the intervening centuries leading up to the birth of Jesus. See, they listen to me. They presumed that being curators of the law sufficed in place of actually obeying the law. Nothing could be further from the truth. Not enough, huh? See, as a, as a minister of the gospel, when I was a baby pastor, I had to deal with this in myself. Because God would speak to me and tell me to do something. And then I would go preach it. I would turn it into a sermon and preach it. And in preaching it, I deceived myself into thinking I did something with what God said. But he didn't tell me to preach it. He told me to do it. And that's why you see so much of a, of a, um, a hypocrisy in the personal lives of our leaders. And I'm not picking on leaders, but even James says, you know, be not many teachers for many things we offend all. You know, there's a great, greater burden of responsibility. And let me tell you something, folks. There is a huge disconnect many times for this reason between the public message of a preacher and the lifestyle of that preacher. And it's a big reason for offense in the, in the church and offense in the world. Because what happens is God is, we're not picking on them, we're just saying God will tell them to do something and they grab the word. It's kind of like mama tells you to clean your room, but you share your room with your little brother. And you go in there and say, mama told you to clean your room. <laughs> and then you go outside and play. Uh oh. You think you did something with what you were told, but you did not. Be here, doers of the word, not just hearers, deceiving your own selves. <laughs> Verse 14 through 20, please. And the Lord said unto Moses, Behold, thy days approach that thou must die. <laughs> Call Joshua and present yourself in the tabernacle of the congregation that I may give him a charge. And Moses and Joshua went, and they presented themselves in the tabernacle of the congregation. And the Lord appeared in the tabernacle in a pillar of cloud, and the pillar of cloud stood over the door of the tabernacle. And the Lord said unto Moses, Behold, thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, and this people will rise up and go a whoring after gods of the strangers of the land, whether they may, whether they go to be among them, and will forsake me and break my covenant which I have made with them. Then my anger shall be kindled against them in that day, and I will forsake them, and I will hide my face from them, and they shall be devoured, and many evils and troubles shall befall them." so that they will say in that day, Are not these evils come upon us because our God is not among us? It's God's fault. Oh, my. Like Adam. Yeah. Where are you, Adam? Oh, if you weren't so scary, I wouldn't have to hide back here and make these fig leaves. We were afraid. No. <laughs> and I will surely hide my face in that day for all the evils which they sh shall have wrought in that they are turned unto other gods. Now therefore write ye this song for you, and teach it to the children of Israel. Put it in their mouths, that this song may be a witness for me against the children of Israel. Let's all sing a song. Let's sing a Let's happy song. Let's all stand song. and sing. <laughs> yeah. for, verse 20. For when I shall have brought them into the land which I swear unto their fathers, that floweth with milk and honey, that they shall have eaten and filled themselves and waxen fat, then they will turn into other gods and serve them and provoke me and break my covenant. Can you imagine? Mm. Let's all sing yeah. a song. We're going to backslide because we're rebels. The anger of the Lord will be kindled against us in that day. Ouch. <laughs> Help us, God. And they were supposed to memorize, the elders memorize this song. Oh, my goodness. And what is it God's really saying? It's many times we give a prophetic word. The circumstance you're going through didn't catch God by surprise. Mm -hmm. He's going to bless them. He's going to love them. But yeah. he knows what's going to come of them. He's it's prophesying. The, it's the mercy <laughs> of God. It's the, the grace of God. God commands Moses wow. to take his successor, Joshua, and enter into the cloud of glory in the tabernacle. It's interesting, this cloud always appeared at the door of the tabernacle, and in John 10, 7-9, Jesus said, I am that door. That door where Moses talked with God, that's, that's me. me. Mm -hmm. I am that door. This is where the voice of God was always heard and guidance was always given. Now, the scriptures teach us that not a tent out in the desert somewhere or a temple in a city somewhere, 
that our bodies are his tabernacles and that Jesus, the door, lives in our hearts. His glory, in other words, we're talking about longevity now, talking about hearing from God. His glory doesn't just visit us there, but he actually abides there continually. Notice he, he, he was there when they were in idolatry. He was there when they rebelled against Moses. He was there when they committed all these ten temptations, these ten major seasons of sinfulness and rebellion the whole time. The manna was there every morning, the water from the rock, the pillar by cloud by day, the fire by night, the glory was always there. He said, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. What a wonderful thing. And uh, our bodies are those tabernacles. He lives in us. His glory doesn't just visit us. It's there continually. We have a visitation mentality. God has a habitation mentality. We need to change that. Amen. See, we're still thinking Old Testament because we're, our leaders are still striking the rock. They're, they got us on the other side of our Jordan. Okay, and guess what? We're going to have to leave some of those leaders behind because God's not going to let them, like Moses, go down to the Jordan. He's not going to let them humble themselves. And you've got to make up your mind. Are you going to have a soulish connection to a charismatic leader just because his face is glowing? Or are you going to get down to the Jordan, cross over into your promised land, and inherit the habitation promise of God instead of out there piddling in the desert with an occasional visitation? Who's with me? Who's with me? I knew he was going to say it. (laughs) (laughs) See, his glory doesn't just want to visit us there, but actually abide there. He wants us to consult him at the door. Jesus is the door. Where is Jesus? He's in your heart. True prophetic ministry today is giving the testimony that can be heard at the door of your own heart. It's turning you to the door. And the door is in you. Jesus is in you. The testimony of the spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus. And so when a prophet speaks, what is he doing? He's looking at Jesus on the inside of you and say, what do you want to say to this person? That's how, how do you prophesy, Russ? How can you prophesy to everybody? I can prophesy at will. I just like I can pray in tongues at will. And how, how does that happen? By looking at Jesus who is the door on the inside of that person, and say, what do you want to say to this person? Amen. Thank you, Lord. And then Moses is uh, instructed to compose a song or an ode that the elders and fathers were to rehearse so that they wouldn't lose their way in years to come when the nation would reject God. Because he never leaves us, and he never forsakes us. At what point... Can you lose your salvation? Is there ever a point once you accept Jesus into your heart that he's not in your heart anymore? You know, I believe I believe you can. The Bible p- seems to plainly indicate that, that if you turn away, it's like the dog turning to its vomit. Mm-hmm. Some people believe that you are saved and are going to heaven, but you'll experience uh, turbulence in this life if you reject your salvation. You get judged temporally, that's what they say. Uh, I don't know about that. But how easy is it to lose your salvation? I think if you ever did, and we get to ask that question occasionally, have I committed the unpardonable sin? Uh, If you ever did, you would never be concerned about asking the question. You'd never ask anybody. Because your conscience would be seared with a hot iron, and there'd be no going back for you. There have been some that I've looked at that I've wondered that are pretty obnoxious, uh, that have just, with great repudiation and really vile attitude, turned from God. But yet there are some people that would make Christians pick up hymnals and throw at them that, yes, I don't like what they're saying, and they claim to have had an experience with God. I believe they did. And while they're saying some pretty obnoxious things now, I, I can sense in my spirit, I feel the witness of the Spirit on the inside of them. Mm-hmm. They're still asking questions. Yeah. And those questions sometimes are inconvenient. One of those is uh, Bart D. Ehrman, one of the most erudite, accomplished Christian historians that known to man. And he was a full-blown, uh, radical Jesus freak when he was younger, but he's turned from his faith, and he openly declares himself to be an agnostic and just rejecting the things that he used to believe in. But I believe that, that God's still in him. And you can listen to him, the kindness in this man's voice. 
And and the questions that he asks tell me he's struggling, yeah. but God's still in him. There are others, and one I won't mention, but there's one who was an evangelist years past, back in the 1950s, still alive today. Man, it just, it doesn't look good. And I'm not his judge. I cannot judge his salvation. And not just anecdotally, I believe from the scripture, and we're not getting into that now, but uh, I believe there is a point that you can walk out. You get to choose. God will not lobotomize you no way. and drag you into heaven. You do get to choose. And uh, maybe we'll cover that uh, some more at a later time. Uh, verse 21 through 30. It's kind of like, can a Christian have a demon? John Wimber says, does the Christian want one? No, thank you. <laughs> verse 21, and it shall come to pass when many evils and troubles are befallen them, that this song shall testify against them as a witness, for it shall not be forgotten out of the mouths of their seed. For I know their imagination, which they go about even now, before I have brought them into the land, which I swear. Moses therefore wrote this song the same day and, I, and taught it to the children of Israel. And he gave Joshua, son of Nun, a charge and said, Be strong and of good courage, for thou shalt bring the children of Israel into the land which I swear unto them, and I will be with thee. And it came to pass when Moses had made an end of the writing of the words of this law in a book, until they were finished that Moses commanded the Levites which bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord saying take this book of the law and put it in the in the side of the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God that it may be there for witness against thee <clears throat> for I know thy rebellion and thy stiff neck behold while I am yet alive with you this day you have been rebellious against the Lord and how much more after my death Gather unto me all the elders of your tribes and your officers, that I may speak these words in their ears, and call heaven and earth to record against them. For I know that after my death you will utterly corrupt yourselves and turn aside from the way which I have commanded you, and evil will befall you in the latter days. Well, the day be we live in. Yeah, because you will do evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger through the works of your hands. Isn't that the truth? And Moses spake in the ears of all the congregation of Israel the words of this song until they were ended. The evil in the latter days, you know. Wow. He's, he's saying that based on things he saw. I believe he looked down and he saw the Holocaust. He saw the swastika. He saw the death's head troops. He saw some things. What an awesome and fearful thing that is. But I want you to look at Verse 24, it says Moses makes an end of writing the law, the Torah, until they were finished. This is the first example we have of what we today call a closed canon. We don't believe the Bible is an open-ended book. You know, the other books of the Old Testament were not held in the same esteem as the first five books of the Bible authored by Moses. In fact, there are many... Uh, of the major and minor prophets that have a strong messianic message, particularly where they talk about a suffering Messiah, those are rejected today by uh, Jewish scholarship because they can't believe those books and reject Jesus. So they reformed the canon. They had a Bible called the Septuagint in Jesus' day that they used for centuries that they completely rejected in the second century and rewrote a whole other version to exclude the passages that they could not refute in terms of Jesus being the Messiah. Mm, interesting. And uh, so the other books of the Old Testament are not held in the same esteem as the first five books authored by Moses. Did you know that there's a belief that they believe that if you could recite the Torah, the first five books of the Bible from beginning to end, that you could say the name of God? If you could say the whole thing from beginning to end without stopping that you would invoke the name of God and release the creative power of God that was in the earth when he said, and God said. My goodness. And because they believe that is, that is the full name of God. Yeah. The five, first five books from beginning to end are the full name of God. <laughs> wow. Um, many people think, so the canon was closed. Many people think that, and you see here, God is doing it. Moses finished, he made an end. What's happening? God is closing the Old Testament canon, at least the Torah, and setting the Torah aside. Now, let's keep reading. 
many people think that the New Testament canon, in fact, the entire 66 books of the Bible were supernaturally ratified and closed as a canon or a holy collection of writings just like this. In their head, if you ask people, they say, well, there was a church council, but there never was. Well, God said that's, that if you add to or take away, well, but the book of Revelation was the last book added to the canon, and it almost didn't make it. And that thing, that, that verse that says you cannot add or take away is not talking about the other 65 books of the Bible because Revelation was not connected with the other 65 books of the Bible for decades after it was written. It was talking about the book of Revelation, not the rest of the book. Now, listen to what I'm saying, what I'm not saying. I'm just <laughs> kicking over your sacred cow, okay? <laughs> I'm trying to help you. I'm not trying to say something weird or wonderful. Uh, many people think that there was a closure of the New Testament canon or the canon of Scripture, the entire 66 books, just as there was here in this verse. Here, plainly, the Torah was closed by God. It's like Noah, shut the, God shut the door. Mm -hmm. And uh, in fact, there was nothing other than in history, from the time of the apostles uh, and through the first 600 years of church history, there was nothing other than a general consensus by the churches, specifically in the first 400 years of Christianity, that these were in fact the 66 authoritative books. And in fact, the collection has been modified from time to time. In the, in the first three centuries of the church, uh, two books that were looked at the same way we look at our canon that were in their Bible, and they didn't accept the book of Revelation universally, but they did accept the Apocalypse of Peter, which you don't even know what that is. But it was considered more highly than the book of Revelation. There was another book called The Shepherd of Hermas, that was widely, it was like the Gospel of John of their day. They, it was well-beloved. And you got to understand, well-beloved. These people looked at their canon, which was different from ours, and they were, were, went into the gladiator arenas and threw themselves to the lions in defense of their gospel. So th what these people died for. So they weren't just people sitting around how many angels could dance on the head of a pen trying to be different from everybody else. Right. And so we have to stop and th just be aware of that. Have some humility uh, where this is concerned. And in fact, th this collection of 66 authoritative books has been modified from time to time. In fact, going from the King James Bible to the NIV, major modifications. If you look at the beginnings and the endings of the books in the NIV throughout, uh, comparing it to the King James, you will see many tried and true verses of scripture that'll make a fundamentalist, you know, head spin around, say, how could you dare take that out of the Bible? But they took it out. What did they do? They, they didn't add to the canon, but they certainly changed it. Because if they took out a verse, it's the same thing as taking out a book or adding one in, for that matter. Am I saying they were wrong or right? I, that's not what I'm getting at. I'm saying we have to have a mature attitude about the scriptures. And they've been modified from time to time. And in fact, even today, major factions of Christianity, there is still not agreement on what constitutes canon. Pick up a Catholic Bible, the Douay-Rheims Bible, and just look through their books and look through ours. Look at the Eastern uh, uh, Coptic Church and see the books they venerate and the books we venerate. <laughs> um, suffice to say this, what am I getting at? Jesus did not die simply to give you a Bible. You know, the cessationists say, yes, we don't speak in tongues today because that which is perfect has come, that which is in part be done away with. If the Bible is perfect, then how come we're churning out a different version every few years? If the Bible is perfect, the Bible is not perfect. Do I believe the autographs, the original manuscripts were perfect? Yes, but we don't have those and we haven't had them for centuries and in some cases for thousands of years. The original book written by Isaiah or Moses, etc. We don't have those. I believe the autographs were what we claim they are, the infallible, inspired word of God. I believe that, but we don't have those anymore. The Bible as we know it came together from fragments, usually at times fragments that are small, so small they have to hold them with tweezers. 
and put them together. Can you imagine holding a crumbling thousands of year old uh, or hundreds of year old manuscript and putting it together trying to figure out what it says? See, the, Jesus did not die to give you a Bible. Jesus rebuked the Pharisees because of their blindness in this area. He's, now I know I'm shaking you and I'm challenging you. I want you to hear me because we tend to approach. God told me one time, he says, my people are guilty of bibliomancy. I said, what are you talking about? They're consulting the book when they ought to be consulting me. Oh and it's exactly well, all I'm saying is what I'm now going to posit to you. John 5, 39 Jesus told the Pharisees, he says, Search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, but they are they which testify of me. What was he saying? He had the same half of the canon, the Old Testament, that we have today. He said, you think this is eternal life for you, but it's not. This is, uh, it, the value of this is only in that it points you to me, and he goes on to say, and you want to crucify me. Mm -hmm. You love the scriptures, but you want to kill me. Mm -hmm. Rejecting the Spirit of Christ, the person of Christ, mm -hmm. embracing that which only points to Christ. Oh, I would never do that. Really? What about the church across the street that has a different pointer than you do, a different doctrine than you do, but yet you won't have anything to do with them, but yet Jesus lives in them. Mm -hmm. But you deny Jesus who lives in them because they don't have use of the same pointer that you do. So we're functionally rejecting, we're choosing doctrinal Christ over the living Christ, and that's the spirit of Antichrist that denies that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. When you deny that Jesus is in that bunch across the road, across the sit, your city, and you, and you say, I don't deny that they're saved, but you functionally deny them by never accepting that God may want you to have a functional, ongoing, intimate relationship with them. Not being open to it. Because of doctrine. The value of the scriptures. If the scriptures were enough, we wouldn't need the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. If the scriptures were enough, as some hold to the doctrine of sola scriptura, the scriptures and that's it. If the scriptures were enough, then there would be no need of the ministry, no need of the church, no need of the gifts of the Spirit. Jesus himself added to the necessity of Scripture the coming of the Holy Spirit who would teach us all things. He did not say, I'm going to get a book published and it's going to teach you all things. He said, I'm going to send the Holy Ghost and he's going to teach you all things. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's dangerous, Brother Walden. You better believe it. You could wreck your life with that thinking. You know what else you could do? You could wreck the gates of hell with that thinking. Come on. It's like a gun. You can do evil or you can do good. Anything that is true and anything that is valuable can either damage or build. It's just like Peter complained about Paul's teachings. The ignorant and the unlearned do rest Paul's teachings to their own destruction. You bet they did. But it was so important to empower everybody else that God was willing to write off the ignorant and the unlearned in order to activate everyone else in God's power. That's powerful. That is meat for men. Mm -hmm. But that's the truth of the gospel. We need to be careful not to ensconce the scriptures in a religious gilding of unbelief because we don't want to be responsible for seeking the counsel of God for ourselves in our everyday life. We look at the scriptures as though they're, they're magic. We have a superstitious... We look at the scriptures as incantations. And I believe in speaking the word. I believe in confessing the word. I do it all the time. But my hope, that book did not bleed for me. Jesus bled for me. And that book is only valuable to me. Not to judge others. Not to segregate myself from others. That book is only valuable to me in that it tells me who Jesus is in my life and what my place is in the kingdom. That is its value. Father, we thank you for your word today. And we thank you that you are spirit and you are life. In the very beginning, you, you say God is a spirit. God is spirit. And so we just take the life of who you are and the word that you've given us, and we thank you for blending them together and making the whole loaf of bread 
that Jesus is that bread of life. And, and Father, we don't want to be like the Israelites that forget you, that forget the word of the Lord. Uh, even though we know it could happen, we don't want it to happen. And we ask that you would help us stir ourselves up in your word and praying in the Holy Ghost because the Holy Ghost will bring to remembrance all things. So we thank you for building us up so we can stand on that firm foundation that is Jesus Christ and him, our Savior and Lord. And we bless the people and we bless each home representative, Father, in uh, this broadcast. In Jesus' name, amen.